democracy is an ongoing struggle. It demands steady leaders, people who willingly confront challenges, who empower others, people who are always learning and seeking change. More than ever, our nation and our world need people who can lead with integrity and civility. Now is the time to act. To ensure a brighter future for generations to come. And the La Follette School is ready to lead the way. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Susan Yaki, the director of the La Follette School of Public Affairs at UW-Madison. And welcome to our third annual policy forum, American Power, Prosperity, and Democracy. In light of recent global events, I cannot imagine a timelier set of topics. We're overjoyed that over 500 individuals registered for today's events. It's so good to see many of you here in person and I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to those who are joining us virtually. I wanted to kick off today's forum by highlighting our vision for these events. As the public policy school here in Wisconsin, we bring a unique approach to discussing the most pressing policy issues of our times. And we think that one of the most important roles that the LaFollette School can play is as a nonpartisan convener bringing people together that have different perspectives and have solution-oriented discussions. We're so fortunate to have panelists today, as well as attendees from across our state and across the country. Each of our panels and our lunch breakout sessions will feature a diverse mix of researchers, journalists, policymakers, as well as community and industry leaders. And our program aims to do two things. First, Tell us, what's the evidence, the data, what's the experience on these important topics? And second, where are there opportunities for collaboration and for innovation? We're confident that today's program will provide a thoughtful discussion of these ideas, as well as some practical applications along the way. I'd like to take a moment to thank the person that made today's events possible, and that's former US Senator Herb Cole. Three years ago, the LaFollet School received a $10 million donation from Coal Philanthropies, which at the time was the largest donation in, schools his, in the school's history. That generous investment has changed the trajectory of the LaFollet School, and it enables us to convene events like our annual forum. And I just want to say a special thanks to Senator Cole. I really appreciate his investment. And now I want to introduce, thank you, isn't that wonderful? And now I want to introduce our faculty chair for today's events, my colleague, Mark Koplovich, a professor in the LaFollette School of Public Affairs, as well as our Department of Political Science. Mark? Thank you, Susan. Good morning to everybody. Uh, I am Mark Koplovich. As Susan said, I'm professor of public affairs and political science. Uh, I'm also the director of the Center for European Studies uh, at UW-Madison, and it's my honor to be the faculty organizer and chair of today's uh, La Follette Forum. Uh, I'm thrilled to see so many in the room already, and welcome everyone who is also joining us online uh, via live stream. So, and I'm really pleased to welcome you to what I think is gonna be an incredibly thought-provoking discussion on some of the most important political and economic issues uh, confronting the US and the world today. Uh, let me first echo uh, Susan in adding my thanks to Senator Cole and Cole Philanthropies for investing in La Follette. Uh, these are very exciting times at La Follette with so many new outstanding scholars joining our faculty and the ability to hold events like this. And we could not be more grateful uh, for Senator Cole's extremely generous support. 
Uh, I'd also like to take a brief moment for a couple additional thank yous. Uh, first, thank you to the Forum Advisory Committee. You've seen their, their names uh, scrolling here. Uh, a, a group of incredible community leaders, faculty, journalists, uh, folks in uh, business and community in the policy making world uh, here in Madison and in Wisconsin. Uh, many of them are leading the breakout sessions at lunch, so I really encourage you to stick around for those uh, and I thank them for their support and advice. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Center for European Studies and its Executive Director Elizabeth Covington for co-sponsoring the event today uh, and providing financial and logistical supports. Uh, and finally, I'd like to thank the entire La Follette School staff, especially the outreach team. Um, if Lisa Ellinger, our outreach director, is here, if she could stand, and Brittany Mitchell, our uh, outreach events coordinator, uh, they are really the people who put this event on. Um, so thank you very much. They've been working tirelessly for months. We're really excited it's here, and it would not have happened without them. Now, today's event, uh, as Susan said, it's entitled American Power, Prosperity, and Democracy. The titles we'll cover are related to my current research on the financial roots of American power in the global economy uh, and what that means for the future of US foreign and economic policy, uh, both here at home and globally. And so my goal in organizing this event was to bring together leading experts from academia, journalism, and the policy world uh, to help all of us here in Wisconsin wrestle with what I believe are three of the most serious challenges that the United States is facing today. First, uh, economic crises and the fallout from them and the threats they pose to the future of American prosperity. Second, the rise of China and the challenge it poses to world order and the future of American global leadership. And third, the rise of authoritarianism and the threat it poses to the future of American democracy. Over the course of the day, we'll hear from these experts on these topics. They will help us better understand the forces shaping the future of American policy and politics, both here at home uh, and abroad. They'll be joined by some of UW-Madison's leading scholars, uh, my outstanding colleagues in public policy, political science, journalism, business, and economics. So I hope you'll stay with us for as much of the day as possible, uh, or as long as you're able. And now we're going to get started with our first session on prosperity, crises, debt, and the future of American economic policy. So I'd like to invite my panelists to join me on the stage. Over the last decade and a half, the US and world economies have been hit hard by almost nonstop crisis, starting with the global financial crisis, continuing through a decade-long Great Recession, uh, and now enduring the shock of the COVID-19 pandemic. These crises raise many tough but crucial questions. How have they, they reshaped the US economy? What more should be done to address the economic damage from these crises, as well as the persistent problems of inequality and the distributional costs of globalization in America? How effective have the economic policies of the Federal Reserve and the Biden administration been since the onset of the pandemic? How serious a problem is inflation, both on its own terms and relative to other challenges such as, such as unemployment, and what should be done about it? To what extent have these crises challenged the dominance of the United States and the dollar in the global economy? And to what extent are problems like debt and deficits serious problems for the United States? We're extremely fortunate to have an amazing panel of experts to help us grapple with these questions here today. It's my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speakers, Adam Posen and Catherine Rampell, along with our discussants, Michael Knatter and Menzi Chin. Adam Posen has been president of the Peterson Institute for International Economics, the leading international economics think tank in Washington, DC, if not the world, uh, since 2013. Under Adam's leadership, the Peterson Institute has won numerous awards for its outstanding policy analysis and research on international trade and finance, macroeconomic policy, and a host of other topics related to the global economy. Over the course of his career, Adam has been both a world-leading scholar and a senior policy practitioner. He pioneered work on the political foundations of central bank independence uh, and understanding Japan's own Great Recession in the 1990s. More recently, he's contributed to research and public policy regarding monetary and fiscal policy, the challenges of European integration since the adoption of the euro, US-China relations, and new approaches to financial recovery and stability. 
Adams served from 2009 to 12 on the Bank of England's Rate Setting Monetary Policy Committee. Uh, he was made an honorary commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II in 2014 for his services to British economic policy. Uh, he served seven terms as a member of the Panel of Economic Advisors for the U.S. Congressional Budget Office. He's received the Order of the Rising Sun from the Government of Japan for his distinguished achievements in advancing U.S.-Japanese economic relations and a very long and wide range of other fellowships and honors from around the world over his career. So please join me in welcoming Adam Posen. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Catherine Rampell is one of the country's foremost economic and political journalists. She is an opinion columnist at the Washington Post and a commentator for CNN, as well as special correspondent for the PBS NewsHour and a contributor to Marketplace. Catherine covers economic policy, public policy, immigration, politics with a special emphasis on data-driven journalism, uh, the very best kind, in my opinion, and those of us here at the La Follette School. Uh, before joining the Post, Catherine uh, wrote about economics and theater at the New York Times. Her work on immigration policy, the trade war, and other policy topics is some of the very best journalism on these issues that you will find anywhere. Catherine also has received a wide range of awards for her work, including the 2021 Online Journalism Award for Commentary and the 2010 Wiedenbaum Center Award for Evidence-Based Journalism. Uh, she is a six-time finalist for the Gerald Loeb Award for Distinguished Business and Financial Journalism, probably the most prestigious award in the field. Yep. Uh, Catherine graduated uh, from Princeton University, and in addition to today's forum, uh, she is here this week at UW-Madison as our spring journalist in residence. So we're thrilled to have her. Please join me in welcoming her. In addition to our keynote speakers, I'm delighted to share the podium with two of my longtime friends and colleagues at UW-Madison, Michael Kinetter and Menzi Chin. Uh, Mike is president and CEO of the UW Foundation and former dean of the Wisconsin School of Business. Uh, he is an expert on macroeconomics, international finance, corporate governance, higher ed funding, and philanthropy. He served on the President's Council of Economic Advisors under both George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton. Uh, prior to joining UW, Mike was Associate Dean of uh, the MBA program and Professor of International Economics in the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth. Uh, Mike graduated with degrees in economics and mathematics from UW-Eau Claire and earned his PhD in economics from Stanford. Menzi Chin is Professor of Public Affairs and Economics. He's the author of Lost Decades, The Making of America's Debt Crisis and the Long Recovery and one of the world's leading experts on international finance and the policy aspects of macroeconomic interactions between countries. Menzi also served on the, economic, on the Council of Economic Advisors in 2000 to 2001 and has been a visiting scholar at a wide range of policy institutions, including the International Monetary Fund, the Federal Reserve Board, and the European Central Bank. Uh, he is co-editor of the Journal of International Money and Finance and co-author of Econ Browser, one of the most popular economics blogs. Menzi received his PhD in economics from UC Berkeley. So I'm pleased to have such a wonderful panel. Uh, we're going to start with Catherine and then Adam. They're each going to speak for about 25 minutes, followed by comments from Michael and Menzi, after which we'll open up for broader discussion uh, and audience questions. My slides are lined up somewhere? Yes. Thanks so much for having me. So I have titled my talk today, The Biden Economy Asterisk, sort of. Uh, the reason why is my standard disclaimer, which is that presidents get too much credit when the economy is good, too much blame when the economy is bad. They don't control the economy. They don't control the business cycle. So it's always seemed kind of a weird formulation to me to talk about the Biden economy or the Trump economy or whatever. It implies an ownership that doesn't exist, but that's how we talk about it. So that's what I'm going to do today. Um, and I will do so by um, talking about two main questions, which is how good the economy is or isn't, and what Biden can or cannot do about it, particularly what tools he has available uh, if Democrats should lose in the midterms this year. Um, so when we're talking about how good or bad the economy is, you have to ask, in relation to what, right? Uh, the two kinds of frameworks that I use are, how are things today relative to what had been predicted, basically, when Biden took office? And then also, how do, things, how do key metrics look relative to some historical long-term trend? Um, and on both of those questions, both of those frameworks, um, 
there's a lot of good and there's a lot of bad. <laughs> um, so let's talk about the good. So on the good, first of all, um, the job market is doing way better today than had been forecast when Biden came into office. This is a chart showing unemployment. Uh, hopefully you all can see it. The, the solid orange line is what unemployment has actually done. That big spike is obviously the, pan the beginning of the pandemic. Um, it has come down. The two dashed lines are forecasts that were issued in February of 2021. The blue one is from the Congressional Budget Office. Um, they were more pessimistic, partly because they had to assume no changes to law. That's, that's part of their marching orders. Um, the grayish line is what the Survey of Professional Forecasters um, released by the Philadelphia Fed, what they were expecting. So they were probably baking in some stimulus as of early 2021. This is before the American Rescue Plan passed. Um, but even they were relatively pessimistic compared to what has happened. And then let's look at unemployment more generally, the longer term trend. Again, huge spike early 2020. It's come down quite dramatically. And in fact, unemployment as of March of this year was 3.6%, very close to what it was right before the recession happened. And pretty close, in fact, to a half century low. Um, so, you know, unemployment is not a perfect me uh, metric, but other kinds of labor market metrics like hiring growth are also quite strong. Um, now, of course, unemployment, hiring, the uh, employment growth, those are not the only forecasts that turned out to be off. This is one measure of inflation, the, con the um, consumer price index. Again, orange solid line is what's actually happened. <laughs> it's been going up. And the blue and gray lines are those forecasts from early 2021, um, suggesting that we were going to have around 2% inflation, which obviously has not happened. Uh, and then longer term trend, um, we are at a 40 year high, which many of you probably already know. So uh, the question is, what happened? Why has, on the one hand, hiring, um, payroll growth, why has that been so much better than forecast? Why has inflation been worse? And the answer is complicated and there's a lot of disagreement. But I would break it down to partly policy choices and partly getting very unlucky. Um, what I mean by policy choices, in particular, that American Rescue Plan bill that passed early last year, um, it was a pandemic relief bill. It cost about $1.9 trillion. And it did a lot of good things. And it did some less targeted and probably wasteful things. It, it had a lot of stuff in it, uh, you may recall, including aid to states and cities, um, a top up of unemployment insurance, rent relief, near universal stimulus checks, an expansion of the child tax credit, et cetera. Uh, and like I said, there are, there are a bunch of things that I think were good. Um, there are a bunch of things that I think were kind of a waste of money. And in retrospect, the overall size of the bill, and many, including some members of our panel, would say not just in retrospect, but in advance, uh, the overall size of the bill looks like it was much too large uh, relative to the hole that was trying to be filled in the economy. Um, that plus very low interest rates by the Fed and some other expansionary monetary policies kept demand really high. Um, which contributed to faster than expected job growth and helped run the economy hot, and it also likely contributed to inflation. So what I mean by that is we, or the government, gave people a lot of cash to spend, and boy, were they ready to spend it. <laughs> uh, cons consumer spending, in fact, is uh, either at or above the pre-pandemic trend. So this is just a measure of you know, how consumer expenditures, consumption expenditures, how much people spend, this is adjusted for inflation. Um, big dip early on in the pandemic, and then we're, we're more than back where we started. Not only that, but consumers are spending money a little bit differently than they used to. They're spending more money on stuff um, relative to their spending habits before the pandemic and a little bit less in, in relative terms on in-person services. So they're buying waffle irons rather than going to brunch at their favorite restaurant. They're buying sports equipment rather than paying that gym membership, things like that. Um, and you can see this again 
in the patterns. This is indexed to the beginning of, um, of the pandemic recession in February 2020. The blue line is spending on durable goods. So that's things, that's a fancy way to say appliances, cars, um, you know, those waffle irons, sporting equipment, things like that. And the red line is services. So services spending has picked up quite a bit, and, and we're about back where we were. But wow, are we buying a lot of stuff. And of course, this is all happening at exactly the same time that it's difficult for the producers of stuff to really ramp up production because supply chains are still messed up around the world. Uh, factories are, um, it's like in China right now, there are a lot of factories that are shuttered. It's, it's hard to get, to book a shipping container, to send things to the United States. Um, there are labor shortages here and abroad. There are logistics problems, et cetera. And, and one thing I do want to clarify is when I say that supply chains are still messed up, I don't mean that they're producing less than they used to. They're actually producing a lot more. Um, there's more throughput through these fragile supply chains than there used to be because we're trying to buy so many things. We, the American consumer, and consumers around the world are trying to buy so many things. It just takes a lot longer for stuff to get made and delivered. Here's one fun little metric that I like, which shows how much time it takes between when a, you know, a new widget or what, you know, a, a new phone or computer that gets picked up from the Chinese factory, put on the boat, shipped across the Pacific, um, unloaded at a port, within the United States and then picked up by a truck, let's say, at that port. It used to be about 50 days pre-pandemic. Today, it's more than double that. Um, so it's just, there's so much throughput that things get slowed down and, and you know, um, there, are, there are bottlenecks. Uh, the, one of these lines is for the US and the other one is for stuff going to, to, the, to Europe, which is having the same problem. Um, Initially, last year, it looked like a lot of these supply chain problems would normalize and people would get vaccinated, schools would reopen, parents who had been, you know, having to deal with remote schooling, et cetera, would go back to work um, and uh, things would normalize. Yeah, demand would be really strong, but producers, uh, factories, shippers, you know, whatever, um, the maritime industry could ramp up production and, and could, 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 supply could meet demand and that hasn't happened. Um, and then, in addition to that, we've gotten really unlucky, as I said. We've gotten a series of bad shocks. We've gotten more COVID variants, the war in Ukraine, which I emphasize the most important and um, tragic consequence of which is obviously the loss of life but, and, and freedoms. But beyond that, it's also disrupted lots of different markets around the world for food, for energy. Uh, I'm sure you see it when you go pump gas, um, and for other kinds of commodities, uh, fertilizer, nickel, copper. So that's all driving prices up further. Um, there's some other miscellaneous disruptions to food. There's an avian flu, which is the last thing we need, driving up the price of eggs. There's a drought in California. There's been some drama at the border involving, you know, sort of theatrical um, inspections of trucks coming across Texas. That's since done, but a lot of produce from Mexico spoiled. And then there, we might have even more unwelcome surprises. There's a big uh, negotiation coming up with the West Coast ports and the longshoremen quite soon. Historically, there have been some disruptions when those negotiations happen. So there could be more. Um, and it's just one thing after another, basically. Understandably, the White House and many Democrats would like to talk about the good things in the economy, that job growth. Uh, of course, that's been somewhat co cold comfort to a lot of Americans. It's great that there's an abundance of jobs, but if those jobs are offering wages or wage growth that doesn't keep up with the cost of living, uh, you know, how, how much should we really be celebrating that? And that's what's been happening. So here's one measure of average hourly earnings. Um, and adjusted for inflation, it's, it, they're, they're indexed to not the current price, but, um, but to, a, to this is how the data comes out, doesn't matter. Anyway, you can see it's been, it's been falling uh, for the last two years. It's not a perfect measure. Um, a lot of people point out, well, this is an average. What matters for a lot of people is um, wages have been rising for um, more at the bottom of the income distribution. Food services workers, hospitality workers, they've been getting the biggest pay increases. And um, that means that poor people, the most vulnerable, should be shielded from inflation. And that hasn't really happened, in fact. It is true that their wages are, are rising faster. But if you look at 
the bundle of stuff that poor people versus rich people buy. Poor people spend more of their budget on gas, groceries, rent, and other necessities, things that have had among the biggest price increases uh, relative to, to higher income households. Um, and there's some other factors affecting this as well. I asked the, some folks at the Penn Wharton budget model, which is like a sort of a research think tank uh, at uh, University of Pennsylvania, to crunch some numbers for me to show if you look at um, how much earnings have grown uh, for different, at different uh, income levels, that's the uh, yellow bar, versus how much that bundle of goods that a household typically spends money on has grown, um, which one is, is higher. And it, you can see, I don't know if you can see in this chart, it's a little complicated, but basically the yellow bar sh is shorter than the blue bar for the poorest households. Um, meaning that their additional expenses have outpaced their earnings. Um, and the opposite is true for the very highest income households. So higher income households are getting smaller raises, but relative to what they're actually spending, um, they're coming out ahead, actually. This is uh, as of the end of 2021. Um, so, you know, poor working families are falling behind. And, and the question is, what can be done about all of this? by policymakers. Really, uh, price stability is up to the Fed. Uh, the Fed is expected to raise interest rates again today, as many of you may know, this afternoon. Um, that's the key tool available to deal with inflation. And it's not a perfect tool, uh, because the way that it operates is by basically making it more costly to borrow, which should put a damper on demand. You know, if it's more expensive to get a mortgage or a car loan, et cetera, maybe fewer people are going to try to buy those things. Um, and historically, when the Fed has raised interest rates to try to get inflation down, most of the time they have accidentally caused a recession, um, which is obviously not what they're, what, not what they're going for, but it's, it's difficult. Um, and given that inflation has run so high recently, they're probably going to have to raise rates much more aggressively. So there's a higher risk that what will be necessary to get inflation down ends up tipping us into a downturn, which we don't want. Now, um, there are tools available to other policymakers, whether we're talking about the White House or Congress, to deal with inflation. They're less powerful, but there are some. Um, and I'll go through some of the things of, that Biden has been doing. Uh, including with Congress's help. So Fed nominations, trying to unwind some of those supply chain problems with the ports, antitrust related stuff, deploying the strategic, strategic petroleum reserve and build back better, such as it is. Um, so the first is Fed nominations. The administration really dragged its feet in naming who they were going to uh, nominate for the Fed. We still have three vacancies because they took so long. I'm glad that they finally named people, but if you can see the fine print, this is from January. They, they finally announced who they were going to nominate as of January, even though one of these vacancies had been open since the Trump years, and the other two were known to, to be coming up far in advance. But look, I'm glad that they finally nominated people. They haven't been confirmed yet. Um, one of them, Sarah Bloom Raskin, who's on this press release, had to withdraw ultimately. Um, but good move. I'm glad that they did it. The second issue, the second thing that they've been trying to do is, um, like I said, unwind some of those supply chain problems. So for example, there was this much ballyhooed uh, announcement last year about helping um, or encourage negotiating with the uh, LA port to operate 24 hours, which sounds great. But if you can't get a trucker to show up at 2 AM <laughs> to pick up things at that port, it probably won't make that big of a difference. So probably didn't hurt anything, but I'm not sure it made that big of a difference. Um, there has been a lot of jawboning and um, grandstanding about antitrust and corporate greed, profiteering. I think this stuff, whatever the uh, unrelated merits of more uh, aggressive antitrust enforcement may be, I think they will have no effect whatsoever on inflation. Um, and in fact, there is a long uh, storied tradition of presidents asking the FTC to investigate anti-competitive behavior whenever gas prices go up. It's gas prices go up and they're like, I'm going to tell the, the FTC, I'm going to ask the FTC to investigate what kind of funny business is going on. And they always find nothing. <laughs> you know, it's always supply and demand. I mean, there is some, there is 
a cartel in the oil industry, but it's not something that the FTC has any control over. That's, you know, OPEC outside of the U.S. Um, so these are just a few examples from uh, press releases past 2001, 2011, 2009. The FTC dutifully investigates, finds nothing. Um, there's the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which is run by the U.S. government. It's a whole bunch of oil, basically. Biden has twice made big announcements about uh, releasing barrels of oil from that. It doesn't make that big of a difference, in part because it is literally a drop in the barrel um, in terms of the quantity of oil that they're releasing relative to global markets. You know, prices are set by global markets. Um, and in fact, I think there are some ways in which um, they have not designed those releases terribly strategically, despite the name Strategic Petroleum Reserve, but we can talk about that later. Um, what they really need to do is try to try to convince producers to ramp up production, and some of the ways that they design these announcements are, are unlikely to do that. There's Build Back Better. Um, this is the president's marquee economic legislation, which subsequently died last year, and it maybe is going to be revived. Biden claimed towards the end of last year that if it were passed, um, it would bring down inflation, citing dubiously a letter from Nobel laureates who, uh, if you actually look up this link um, that for this story that I, I have screen grabbed here, you can see all of the Nobel laureates uh, responded, is that what you said? And they're like, eh. <laughs> Not really. Um, and on the other side of things, Republicans have argued Build Back Better would uh, increase inflation. I think the reality is it's going to have, it if it were to pass, it would have negligible impact either way. There are some elements that were inflationary, some that were disinflationary. But never waste a crisis, right? It's like we're, we're having this inflation problem. That's an excuse to get all of the other stuff Democrats have always wanted to get done, done. Um, some other things that the administration could or might do. And I'll go through these. So first, uh, if you think that part of the problem is that fiscal policy was too expansionary, we gave people too much money, you could take some of that money back by raising taxes. Uh, I think that's very unlikely to happen, including because Democrats have set a lot of constraints on themselves about whom they would raise taxes, whom they could raise taxes upon. Biden has said nobody making under $400,000, which is 95% of the population. Uh, Kirsten Sinema, the senator from Arizona, has basically said, and also nobody above $400,000, or not exactly in those words. But, and besides, even if they did pass something, it wouldn't kick in for a couple of years, probably. Um, they could remove some of the tariffs and other trade restrictions. Tariffs are not the primary cause of inflation, but they are a, a, a reason why prices are higher here for a lot of goods than they are abroad. Um, and a lot of these tariffs were put in place by Trump. And when he put them in place, Democrats excoriated him for it, um, saying, this is terrible. This is going to hurt American consumers, American businesses, et cetera. I'm thinking about the steel tariffs, washing machines, uh, solar panels, um, $300 billion worth of Chinese goods, et cetera. But lo and behold, Biden comes into office and has been really slow about removing any of them. Uh, just to give you an example, Sorry, this chart is so ugly, but <laughs> it's showing steel prices in the U.S. versus in Europe, China, and elsewhere. And the dark blue line at the top shows how much higher steel prices have been here in the U.S. Biden has loosened some of the trade restrictions in the past year and kind of changed the tariffs into basically a quota for a bunch of countries. So the gap is narrowing, but we're still paying a lot more. And that affects American manufacturers. It affects uh, home builders, right? We have a shortage of housing right now. There are all sorts of economic reasons why you might want to uh, remove some of these trade restrictions, but not just economic reasons. Um, national security reasons. Why, are we, why do we still have national security tariffs on Ukrainian steel? <laughs> um, th those were put in place by Trump. Europe has removed a lot of its tariffs on Ukraine, and we still have this in place. At this point, it's mostly symbolic. I don't know how much a war-torn country is actually trying to export in steel. But, you know, it's like, why are we doing this to our friends? And then there are uh, other objectives that might be achieved by removing some of these tariffs. Like, why, why are we still tariffing solar panels? Again, those were put in place by Trump. They were modified and extended by Biden. And there's an ongoing investigation actually now at Commerce um, that might increase those tariffs further. That's the, the second link there. That's from, uh, I guess, just last week. Immigration. 
Uh, like I said, labor shortage is still a problem. There are a lot of reasons for that, but one has to do with the fact that we just have many fewer immigrants. Despite like, popular belief that the country has been overrun by immigrants, actually immigration has plummeted, particularly legal immigration, has plummeted in the past few years, partly due to Trump policies predating the pandemic and then partly due to the pandemic and the interaction of those things. Um, broader immigration reform would require Congress, not going to happen. But there are, there's some low-hanging fruit that the Biden administration could do. Um, to speed up processing of legal immigrants uh, who are allowed in under current law, who have not been allowed in because the bureaucracy is so backlogged and consulates are still closed around the world, et cetera. So just to give you some quantitative sense of this, um, this is a chart showing the population of foreign-born working age people in the U.S. That's the sort of bluish line um, versus if you kind of extended the trend from before 2020. And you can see there's just like this, this gap of people who never came. Um, and again, that's not because of a change to the law. It's just the, there are these regulatory and bureaucratic problems and the, that the Biden administration says it is working on. Um, the other issue has to do with, because of those bureaucratic problems, people already here, already working, their work permits had been expiring because um, the government was supposed to renew them and they were just really slow. I wrote about a doctor uh, last year whom this happened to. She was working in a, um, in a high needs area in California, a rural area in California. She's had to stop working because her work permit expired. Actually, there was a big announcement yesterday that dealt with some of this stuff. So that, that was a uh, good improvement. Then there's some other miscellaneous regulatory stuff. There's the Jones Act, which restricts which ships can go from one U.S. port to another. There are some waivers that they could, they could consider if they want actually more competition there. You know, maybe they could encourage some states to liberalize their zoning laws if we want more housing or to liberalize uh, occupational licensing requirements, stuff like that. I, you know, I don't know how big of a deal that'll, that would make. They're doing some of it, but those are tools. And then finally... Um, these are some things that they are considering um, or maybe undertaking at the moment that I think could actually make things worse, <laughs> but that Biden has, has shown interest in. I mentioned the solar tariffs. This whole corporate greed narrative, um, I think at best it's going to be ineffectual. I think at worst it could encourage some actual bad policies, including things like a windfall profits tax on oil. Sounds great if you think the problem is profiteering tax the profits, but it, the way that it works, uh, and we've done this before actually, it would probably reduce the supply of oil, not going to be helpful if you want in the near term anyway, gas prices to go down. Um, broad student debt forgiveness, it might require Congress, there's some argument about whether Biden could you know, actually wave a wand and eliminate 50 grand in debt from uh, every uh, uh, student debtor in America. I think some of the stuff that he's done that's been more targeted, including making our very dysfunctional public service loan forgiveness program work better. I think that's quite good. I'm, I'm much more skeptical about uh, a broader policy that forgives the debt of, um, you know, high wage people, um, particularly if we're worried about inflation and people having more cash to spend. And then there's a bunch of made in America stuff, which is very, very popular. I'm sure it's actually popular in this state, but it's going, if, if the government says all uh, all of the infrastructure that's bought through that bipartisan infrastructure bill last year has to be made with U.S. steel, U.S. iron, which is what Biden has said. Uh, that's going to drive up those, those costs and will have some knock-on effects. So uh, I'll leave it there, and I'm happy to take further questions. But uh, thanks so much for your time, and, and we'll talk further. Good morning. Um, I'm very grateful to all of you for coming out and for the La Follette School maintaining this forum. And kudos sincerely to the to the Coke, uh, sorry, to the Coal Initiative. <laughs> I have very little to thank the Coke Initiative for. Um, sorry. Um, the Cole Initiative, Senator Cole and his legacy, and particularly the community of scholars around the La Follette School. Um, three, uh, Catherine's talk was great, but the, the three faculty members, uh, Mike, Menzi, Mark, are all exemplars. 
in the fields that I follow of people who are publicly engaged while doing top quality research and genuinely wanting to be engaged with the public. And uh, I think given the history of La Follette and, and Wisconsin uh, about an active, informed public, I think this is great to see this tradition continuing. So I'm proud to be here as part of that. Um, Catherine did a great job of taking you through uh, what are some of the policy options that President Biden could potentially undertake to make things better in the near term uh, on the assumption, which I personally find both accurate and unfortunate, that the Dems are likely to lose control of one or possibly both houses of Congress this fall. Um, what I'd like to do is take you a little bit longer term and cross-nationally uh, in perspective on the course of U.S. prosperity over the last several years and the year, few, next few years to come. Um, many of my specific policy bottom lines are very similar to Catherine's, but I, I'm just going to broaden the discussion in a certain way. And what scared me as I was preparing for this session um, with, under Mark's guidance um, is that I'm beginning to fear prosperity sounds like an old-fashioned word, that it's a word that, you know, peace and prosperity, something that American politicians once upon a time spoke of, and now it's very hard to speak of without it ringing hollow. I'm not sure that's fair. Uh, we are still, uh, on a per capita basis, the richest large country in the world. Um, and the actual extent of poverty in the U.S., while sh unforgivably high, is lower in two senses than it has been for much of our history, both in absolute terms, the amount of calories and living space and health standards of poor people in this country and as a share of society. So that doesn't mean we should settle for this. We shouldn't. But just we, we, we have to start. And then if you broaden, start there, and then if you broaden your perspective and you look at what is happening in the lower income economies of the global south, as it's referred to, because it is geographically primarily people south of the equator. Um, in terms of their access to medicine, in terms of their access to stable capital and finance, it, it is a very marked difference. Um, so we, we have to start there, that there is this oddity that I feel, and I think many people would feel being self-conscious about talking about U.S. prosperity as a current condition, even though on many bases, relative and absolute, we are actually pretty prosperous. And, and that, in a nutshell, um, is essentially the issue, and that's why it's so important to have this kind of interdisciplinary discussion of serious journalists, academics, policymakers, political scientists, economists, and, other, and public policy scholars, because the perceptions and misperceptions of our economy um, are very profound. And as Catherine's written about in the past, as, as Mark works on, as Menzies occasionally tried to point out in his Twitter, Mike now is uh, an ambassador for the university, so he does less of this. But, um, you know, the, the perceptions don't necessarily match up with the economic outcomes, let alone, as Catherine rightly raised, with who gets the blame and who gets the credit. And, and this is not unique to the U.S. right now, but I think it's important as we have the discussion in our public sphere, in our increasingly distorted public sphere, about issues of partisan knowledge, partisan framing, mainstream media failures, um, that the economic realities be seen as part of that, that there are these very large divergences in how people see the economy from what is actually going on. And so in one of Catherine's charts in particular, the stuff about labor force participation and unemployment, or the more complicated chart with the overlaying bars, I'm free riding on her slides, obviously, but I knew she'd do it, so it's good. Uh, the, over, the overlaying bars about how much people's actual purchasing power or income went up versus what the, what the cost of living, you know, these, these are not 
out there. But ultimately, we do have to confront reality. <laughs> so, so let me shift from, with that caution about perceptions, shift to a reality, telling you about a reality that is very much misperceived. So I run the Peterson Institute for International Economics, and we're essentially the intellectually honest pro-globalization people. And um, we think we have a good case. Um, we're not getting as much traction with it as we would like. Um, so let me, let me give you a bit of a reality check on the US and globalization, which ultimately relates to the prosperity we do or do not feel right now. Um, the U.S. has actually been withdrawing from the global economy for 20 plus years on almost every dimension. So there's a perception, understandable, um, that Trump made these massive changes. But actually, if you go back and look at the data, um, basically, depending on what measure you use, since 1995, the U.S. has basically been closing itself off along various dimensions. Sorry, I'm being very repetitive here. I, I'm still on morning time, sorry. Um, so just to be tangible, if you think of as a rough measure uh, how open an economy is, is the sum of imports and exports compared to its income. So if you go to like a Singapore, which or what Hong Kong used to be, which is a global entrepot, does huge amounts of trading, Exports with imports are actually multiple fold of their national income because they're taking in so much stuff and putting out so much stuff. Most economies in the world, and certainly most higher income economies in the world, um, tend to have ratios of around 60% of exports plus imports as a ratio of GDP. If you look around Western Europe, they all are in there. Canada, Australia, again, it varies, but broadly speaking. And these ratios have been going up basically every year except in the immediate aftermath of the global financial crisis, sort of plateaus and then starts going back up again. And then again, it dips briefly during COVID and goes back up again. So just all these charts are available on Peterson website. But anyway, it just goes up. U.S. goes like this. U.S. hasn't exactly been contracting its openness, but it has been flat at a very low number in the low 20s percent range um, for 25 years when the rest of the world is increasing trade. If you look at foreign direct investment, which is I know people in Wisconsin are aware of, uh, when a company from abroad purchases or even builds and invests in a facility in a, in a foreign country, in this case the US, the US inward foreign direct investment, it jumps year to year because occasional big deals happen, but basically it has also been flat for 20 years uh, in nominal terms, in dollar terms. In real terms, it's declining. And other economies, including Canada, Europe, Japan even, which is considered very closed, Australia, they've all been trending upward over this period. If you look at immigration, and Catherine presented a chart with one cut at immigration, we have a bar chart um, looking at the rate of growth of foreign-born people in the U.S. in a given period. And basically, it reaches a peak in the post-war period around um, 1990 to 95, and then every five-year period since it just trends down. Um, I can go on. The, the U.S. has been consistently across Democratic and Republican administrations, consistently across Trump and Biden, been withdrawing from the global economy. And there is this strong perception out there that much of our problems, much of our inequality in particular, is due to us having been unfairly treated by the Chinese economy or by the European economy or by the Japanese economy, but especially the Chinese economy. And that this is the source of a lot of our trouble. And it just doesn't fit the facts. Um, it fits the facts that China came into the world economy and their billion and a half people tried to make a living. It fits the facts that various countries, including China, would kind of cheat in various ways on trade. But let's be honest, the US cheats in a lot of ways on trade. I and mean, Catherine made reference not directly to this, but Buy America programs, various quotas and tariffs. 
I mean, I, I'll, 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 at, at some risk, I'll do a, a football an analogy. Um, Tom Brady probably did deflate his footballs. <laughs> That's probably not why he won seven Super Bowls, right? So, you know, these, these kinds of, and I come from New England, by the way, so this is painful. Um, so we've had this whole thing of blaming our problems, a large part of our problems in political, some politicians on both parties blaming our problems on the external world economy, but I would argue it goes the other way. It's the blame game is encouraging us to withdraw, and our problems may be becoming in part because we're withdrawing from the world economy, because we're withdrawing from competition, because we're withdrawing from the variety of ideas and of people and of influences. So again, just to give you a sense of this, there's a famous set of papers out there called the China Shock Analysis. Um, my colleagues on the panel, particularly Menzi, know this literature well. Um, and uh, David Autor and Gordon Hansen are the lead authors on this stuff. And Okay, if you even take their stuff at face value, which there's a lot of technical reasons you shouldn't, but if you even take their stuff at face value, what they basically say is, we lost 1.5 million manufacturing jobs over 15 years more than we would have if China didn't exist. Now, China exists. I'm afraid that's not an economic assumption. <laughs> but just again, not to say no sympathy for this, but just, just to give you some perspective. There are 165 million workers in the US workforce. In an average year, roughly 60 million of them change jobs. Now, a lot of those are people voluntarily changing jobs. A lot of those are young people who, of course, change jobs very frequently. So let's call it there's between 30 and 40 million people in a non-recession year who change jobs involuntarily. So then you take the 1.5 million supposed losses blamed on China. And even if you accept that, that's 100,000 a year. What's 100,000 a year in a churn of involuntary unemployment in the US of 40 million? It's a very small number. Moreover, why is it that the working woman in, in, in custodial services in a hotel in New York losing her job, or the fast food worker in Madison, Wisconsin, or the junior lawyer who doesn't make partner, or whoever is any less valuable for losing their job than those specific manufacturing workers? And the answer is ethically and economically not. They're the same. So we've fallen into this rabbit hole of talking about China and talking about the global economy and blaming a lot of our problems on that when the evidence goes the other way. Now, what makes this problematic beyond simply being inaccurate and slightly offensive um, is that we have good evidence that being part of the global economy actually helps. I mean, this is sort of the premise of how did Japan, Germany, and now China get ahead? Well, they were part of the global economy. Um, Again, if we want to get into the, to the detailed econometric academic evidence, and, and again, Mike and, and Menzi knows this literature well, essentially there's not clean evidence that being more open on the measure I said, exports plus imports as a share of GDP automatically translates into higher growth. It, it's, it's kind of, it, it's, you can't show that it's negative for growth, but you can't really show it's positive. It's a lot more conditional. But on all the other things I spoke about, immigration and foreign direct investment in particular, and then competition more generally, all of those are very clearly and conclusively demonstrated to be good for growth and good for productivity growth. And th the issue is, and part of the reason I talk about this multi-dimensional withdrawal of the US from globalization is because I view globalization, and I think rightly, it's multi-dimensional. It's a fabric of ties. It's business networks, it's human networks, it's educational networks, it's trade deals, it's global value chains, it's investment projects, it's transfer of technology, it's innovation, it's cultural goods and travel. They're all together. And so to change a little bit the focus, 
I think what we're facing now is after decades of the U.S. deglobalizing, we are facing a global corrosion of globalization. And I use the, you know, there's a lot of articles out there. There's deglobalization, globalization, whatever. I use the term corrosion deliberately because if you've got this multi-layered fabric, in some places you're getting holes all the way through the fabric. In some places some layers are fraying. It's not just like there's a, a scissors that comes along and just cuts through the fabric and that's it, globalization's ended. It's that the evenness, the strength, the quality is eroding around us. And I think recent events, namely COVID and the Russian brutal invasion of Ukraine have fundamentally accelerated this process. So we had this going on. As I mentioned, most countries, including China, including Europe, including a lot of middle income economies, have been global, continuing to globalize over the last 20, 25 years while the US has not. Uh, it's not just China or just one other. But that now, I think, is going into reverse or is stopping. And so on the one end, you have the fact that the US has been withdrawing. And since the US had the role of political leadership in many of the international fora and many of the informal arrangements, the US misbehaving a little more than the past and not participating has damages. But also, there is real reason, as I know will be discussed in the rest of today's conference, for some suspicion of China. I mean, again, the, the, the deflation of footballs may not have led to Tom Brady's success, but that doesn't mean that we trust Tom Brady with everything, right? Um, you know, there's real reason for distrust and, and conflict with China. It's just not the economic trade reason. Um, and so with those two things in the background, you have COVID, and as is much talked about now, quite rightly, you have some unraveling of what are called global value chains. So let me pause for a moment and put that in perspective. Global value chains are essentially the, the, the taking to an extreme the Toyota logic of just-in-time delivery and getting your best supplier. You, you, you distribute what, and it's easiest to think of in terms of manufacturing and parts, but it affects some business services and some, some other things as well and agriculture. You know, you essentially break down your economic process and put everything where it's most efficient. And um, this has economies of scale usually, and this has benefits that you, you, as you break down your process, you're also marketing and distributing in the same process. So it's tended to be very economically efficient. But the key insight people have to understand, and some of you who, who work or worked for large corporations, I'm sure understand, this wasn't some top-down, brilliantly planned map. This wasn't people in Caterpillar headquarters, or IBM headquarters, or Toyota headquarters, or even Microsoft headquarters, sitting there and saying, let's put this here, let's put this here. It was an organic process. It was, you say, I need to hit this revenue target, and five layers down in the company, somebody is told, hey, you need to make some cost savings, and that person five layers down in the company decides, oh, hey, I can get a bid from Turkey for this part instead of making it in Germany or the US, I'll do that. And so it is quite understandable, it's not good, but it's quite understandable that we get to COVID and we get to national security fears and suddenly these value chains look insufficiently resilient. Where you're dependent on one particular spot which might be subject to viruses, might be subject to invasion, might be subject to being on the wrong side of the political divide, and you realize, hey, this is really not a good idea. And for what it's worth, um, at the Peterson Institute, we do have some support from multinational corporations and also from nonprofits. But anyway, and so we get to talk to some of these companies. And when you talk to these companies, it's very clear that's what's going on. That they were playing catch up just to learn what their global value chains actually looked like because they had just spread out in this unsupervised way. And they're like, oh my God. So what's happening now as part of this reaction is people are saying, OK, we got to make these value chains more resilient. We got to make them more diversified. And increasingly, we got to think politically. 
you know, if, if we, if we want to have some production in China in order to sell it to China, that's fine. But if we do production in China, we may not be able to bring it back to the U.S. in future and vice versa. And so we're moving into a world where I fear the, the growth problems, the underlying growth problems are going to get worse and look more like the perceptions. Um, so we have a situation where, again, rationally, I think, um, businesses and investors are saying, hey, we need to put more resiliency in, we need to friendshore or reshore or reallocate where we put production. We may need to think about separating our efforts for greater China from North America and from possibly Europe. And that's right, but we should all recognize that that's probably going to cost us all money. It's, I mean, when you buy, if you're a company or a person, you buy an insurance policy. It can be a well-priced insurance policy and the right thing to do, because if, God forbid, X happens, whether that's a pandemic, invasion of Ukraine, or whatever, you have some support. But it doesn't earn you revenue when, until that happens. It just is a cost, right? And so we're moving from a world we're moving to a world where rightly, everybody's going to be paying a lot more insurance costs. And some of those insurance costs are inevitable, like in response to pandemics, and some of those are the response to politics, which may be right, but nonetheless, it's US-China tensions, Russia being excluded. And as we do that, you're gonna see less easy flows of people and ideas across the world. And that's going to reduce innovation. That's going to reduce the sharing of technology. And if this stays in, in place for a while, what happens is you start getting different standard setting and different networks for, say, Chinese technology and American technology. <laughs> and that's going to be bad for both. Probably American technology will do better, which is why I naively am not that worried about the military threat from China in the end. I mean, if I was living in Taiwan, I might be, but not in the US. Um, but in the end, we're all worse off if science gets divided in the world. And, and so we're going down a path, unfortunately, that I think is, is quite dangerous. And two other factors, I think, come in. Um, and we saw this in the Cold War, and Mark and some of his colleagues in international political economy know this stuff very well. You get into a situation where investment decisions become more and more politicized and national security issues get involved. Now again, I don't want to suggest that, you know, like the US was not involved in setting up Chiquita Banana throughout Central America, right? I mean, it's not like there's never been any exploitation, it's all been pure market. But the extent to which developing countries become a political football and the jobs and the companies and the opportunities within those countries are subject to political gatekeepers from abroad does vary over time. And I think we're in a period where now it's going to get more and more politicized. And so an interesting case recently, um, and Menzi can correct me if I'm mischaracterizing this, but you know, Argentina for the 19th time was getting ready to default on its uh, foreign debt. And they had an IMF program, and the IMF program, which is basically a bridge loan to reorganize their loan so they can pay later, um, they were getting ready to default on that too. And the Chinese came along in various forms and said, well, we'll give you money to do this. There's a few conditions, but don't worry about that right now. Take the money, and it's much nicer than the IMF. And the Argentinians went to the US government and via the IMF and basically said, China's offering us a lot of money. What are you going to do? And the US government came back and said, well, you know, we really don't want you to take that money from China. It's like, well. And the Argentinians got a better deal from the IMF than they should have and would have on a normal basis because the US leaned on the IMF to give them better deals. Now, there are some countries that are going to be able to play this game. So just imagine like bidding wars in the US, Wisconsin versus New Jersey, you're trying to get that Foxconn plant and you're busy bidding. And as with that Foxconn plant, what you're bidding for may not pay off in the end. <coughs> Excuse me. I got a little dry there. Um, you know, and, and so to be a little less facetious about it, 
this is not a world that's conducive to long-term development for poor people in the world. If, you, if, if aid becomes even more of a political football than it's been for some time, it's more uncertain, it's less well-directed, it's more subject to corruption. It, it's just bad. And then domestically, and this is something I've written about, but many others, there's a great book that was a bestseller a couple of years ago by Thomas Pick, um, Philippon, what was it called? Um, on the collapse of competitiveness in the US. I can't remember its name. Thomas Philippon, very good book, based on a lot of research. The US economy, to go back to my initial statement, has been having declining dynamism for a long time. If, if you look at the number of people who move state to state or long distances for work, if you look at the number of people going to higher education, if you look at reallocations between industries, if you look at how much there's what's called industrial con 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 the little, excuse me, concentration. This is what Catherine was referring to about the FTC and the cartel in oil. You know, that there are nowadays in the US, it's companies tend to have larger market share and more pricing power than they used to. Um, during Obama, a colleague, current colleague of mine, Jason Furman, led a bunch of efforts at the Council of Economic Advisors looking at this, and there's very strong evidence that it's not just Amazon and Facebook, though of course it's Amazon and Facebook or whatever they're calling it now. Um, it's many industries. And so the worry I have is that this situation in the world, this corrosion of globalization, is going to reinforce those anti-competitive tendencies in the US and make things worse. So let me do, having been that depressing, let me now turn to the bits of good news and the sort of linking it back to some of the bigger picture things that Mark talked about, or at least attempting to. So in terms of good news, can we get back to peace and prosperity as a good term, as something confident? Probably not entirely, but we can get a long way back. Um, the ability of the US and Europe and certain Pacific allies like Japan, South Korea, Singapore, Australia, to further integrate their markets, to further open themselves up, is very substantial. And that's not a complete substitute for dividing the world down the Chinese border, and, but it can make a material difference to our competition, to our innovation, to our migration, to our dynamism. So there is a path to dealing with democracies and liberal market economies in some countries that are both that we can do, even if we decide as a people or our elected representatives decide that we have to have a more conflictual choice with China. We can make up for a lot of it. Not all of it, but we can straight up make up for a lot of it. Second, and again, there are others in this room who can speak about this better than I can, but my reading of the literature, of the history, of the evidence is that all this politicization of trying to score whether Chad or Nicaragua or um, Sri Lanka is on the Chinese side of the ledger or the American side of the ledger is foolishness. Um, we, Peterson Institute, at a Chinese official's request, did a published report on the idea of the Belt and Road Initiative um, right when it was starting, when it was still called the Silk Road, I believe. And um, we published in a couple papers by colleagues, including Robert Lawrence and Colin Hendricks, pointing out that the American pseudo-empire and the British Empire didn't go so well. And so another thing that we can do that is more constructive would be to just say no, not politicize the IMF and the World Bank and aid and FDI decisions. And it requires being somewhat callous that if a country decides to go with China, as Sri Lanka has done and, and gotten itself into a lot of trouble, as Sri Lanka has done by so doing, just let it happen. And that sounds pretty obnoxious, but it's better than treating them as a, a pawn in a chess game or getting into a bidding war, in my view. It'd be better, so you want to talk about US restraint, that would be a place for US restraint. And I think that would have benefits, frankly. A third thing we can talk about, and going to the short term, is Catherine rightly, in my view, um, emphasize a lot about inflation. And Mark and I, who agree on a lot of things, don't entirely agree on the current 
causes and effects of inflation in the U.S. But I do think it's fair to say that when inflation is this high and it's this unpopular, it's something you have to deal with. Um, and in the discussion, I'm happy to go into why and how I think we have the inflation we do now and what the Fed can do. But just to say, I think we are in better shape to withstand the Fed doing a major tightening cycle than we've been basically ever in the post-war period. Um, because of the transfers and the shift in spending patterns that Catherine and others have spoken about, the average household balance sheet and the average um, non-financial corporate balance sheet is in better shape now than it was in 2019 pre-COVID. And in 2019, on various measures, these balance sheets, these debt to income ratios were better than they had been in 20 years. And this is true for the vast majority of Americans, not all Americans, but it's more like 80%. It's not just the upper 1%. And so if the Fed almost, well, the Fed will tighten interest rates by 2.5 to 3 percentage points this year, it may cause a recession. I'm hopeful it won't quite. But we are in better shape to stand it than we've been in many past cycles when the Fed has tightened unlike, say, 2008, unlike, say, 1985. And so I am quite confident that two years from now, the U.S. will be largely back to trend growth and the inflation will be largely down. It may be down at 3% rather than 2%, and that might not actually be such a bad thing, but it's not going to be continuing, and, and growth is not going to go down for a long time. So in that sense, I think there is some good news. Let me conclude with one more point on good news, and then, as I said, I'll try to link it back. So one of the topics which Mark set for us and which others can talk about, and I'm happy to talk about in the discussion, is the issue of dollars and debt. Um, do we, should we worry about the debt? Should we worry about the role of the dollar? There's a lot we can discuss, but if you take away one thing, don't worry. Okay. Nothing is going on that's going to erode the roles of the dollar or the ability of the U.S. to pay its debt in the near term. If anything, a world that becomes more driven by national security divisions will drive more money into the U.S., more money into the dollar, out of scary, risky assets into U.S. treasuries. The interest rates are going to go up for a little while in nominal terms to get the inflation down, but in real terms, interest rates remain quite low. Um, so, again, we can go into more detail, but just don't worry about that. The one thing which I do worry about, which does relate to the dollar and debt, and which goes back to where I started, we are a divided economy, a divided society, rather, along racial lines, along rural-urban lines, along geographic distribution, along ideology. And I think it is fair to say, though it's sickening, to say that the, those are lining up increasingly. I mean, again, I'm not by any means the first to say this, right? You know, if, if you're someone who's a rural white person, you probably are going to vote a certain way and believe certain things about immigrants. And if you're an urban person of high education or a person of color, you're probably going to vote a different way and have different views about immigrants and trade in the world. And of course, given the Supreme Court right now, where I, I, I'm, anyway. Um, what does this mean economically? Because that's my brief. The only thing, going back to where I started, that as unhappy as we are, we really are quite prosperous. The only thing that could really undermine US prosperity, and the main thing that creates inequality in the US, is this kind of division. And by division, it's by the rightward racist national swing of a large part of the population. It is not an equal division that is just partisanship is bad. No, it's partisanship is fine if both parties are within the range. And so the biggest threat to U.S. economic well-being over the medium term, meaning three to 10 years out, 
is the same threat to American democracy, which is right-wing extremism and the ideologies that go with it. And um, that's part of what I've devoted my life to, is trying to tell the truth about the economics so people cannot use it as a club to pursue bad policies in all fields. And thank you for letting me set out the case today. I thought we were ending on good news, but uh, I, I suppose not so. Uh, thank you to Catherine and to Adam for covering an enormous amount of ground, raising really important issues and topics and doing it in, in such a clear way. I have to say, as, as the political scientist up here, I am uh, pleased that the journalists and the economists are talking about politics as well, even if it's pointing us in directions that raise lots of questions and, and tensions. Uh, so we're pleased to have discussions uh, as well, uh, first Menzi and then Mike. So please join us. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks to Mark for the kind introductions and uh, the invitation uh, to present uh, in the uh, company of such esteemed uh, scholars and speakers. I mean, um, it's, uh, if I can have the presentation up, the, um, ah, excellent, it's down here. The, um, I, I don't find myself in any disagreement with uh, the broad points that have been uh, laid out by both Catherine and Adam. In fact, it's a masterful tour of both the the uh, intricacies of the challenges that are facing the American economy now, and then the broad picture of the challenges that face both the global economy and the U.S. economy. So uh, given that my time is very short, I'm fortunate that I don't have any disagreements to, to discuss. Uh, so I'll just talk about the things that, that um, uh, sort of jumped at me in thinking about American power and prosperity. Uh, one of the things that I've been thinking about is, uh, next slide, is this, uh, 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 is dollar primacy eroding. And so I'm going to be taking off at this point, segueing from Adam's point about the dollar and debt and so forth, and should we worry? Um, and I guess the, the first thing that people talk about, and it comes up about every 10 years about American power, is the role of the dollar. And, you know, just to... Am I doing the right thing? Um, just to point it out, here is a time series plot of the share of dollars in all the foreign exchange holdings of the central banks um, around the world that report to the IMF. And, you know, essentially in the early part of the period, you see these squares, and these are the squares that denote the share of reserves that are, <clears throat> as far as we can tell, in dollars. And you can see that early on, in roughly the uh, late 70s, early 80s, we're up to as high as 80%, very close to it. And then it's, there are these movements up and down. Um, and then you know, at some point in 1999, we get these sort of more hard estimates of the share of the dollar. And so as the dollar's share in foreign exchange reserves of central banks goes up and down, these concerns about whether the dollar will lose its primacy as the key international currency. By key international currency, I mean not just are you being held by central banks, but are you being used in international financial transactions? Are you being used as the, the uh, currency that you invoice goods and services being traded across borders? Um, is international debt being denominated in dollars? Okay, And so what you can see from this picture is it looks like a, a, a long, slow erosion in the role of the dollar, particularly if you look at the thin blue line or thin greenish line that's below the dark blue line, that's the actual recorded amounts of uh, foreign exchange reserves in dollars um, in, in uh, central bank holdings. Well, um, that looks like a big decline partly because countries, including importantly China, for a long time didn't report it, the composition of its holdings. And so there was this big gray, literally, uh, component called unallocated. And so we don't actually know during the years from 1999 onward to about 2018, 17, uh, how many dollars were being held uh, in foreign exchange reserves. But you can kind of guess that, say, if about two thirds roughly is in dollars, then you have that, that blue line there. So what's true is over time, uh, the share of holdings of the U.S. dollars has kind of moved downwards over time. It hasn't weaved in and out as much as you might have thought 
um, given so popular uh, journalistic or popular uh, expositions on the issue. So should I worry about the decline in the share of the dollar, particularly um, right now? So you can see in the past few years, there's been a noticeable decline. On top of it, we've seen in recent events the use of, in some ways, the dollar or at least financial systems associated with the United States or the U.S. banking system uh, via sanctions um, affecting, in ways, American foreign policy. And so whether that's going to lead to other countries moving away from the dollar, that's the sort of the question at hand. So I have twofold uh, issues here. One's what's the long-term prospects for the dollar? <clears throat> and on top of that, um, has the use of sanctions, uh, the use of the dollar's power in a sort of way, uh, in terms of uh, forwarding uh, American foreign policy goals, has that accelerated or had an impact or leads to prospects for further uh, erosion of the position of the dollar? Well, you know, of course, in any of these conversations, uh, what's come up is, well, who's gaining and who's losing? Uh, at one juncture, uh, several years ago, a well, decade and a half, we would have thought the euro was going to be the currency uh, at hand that would be challenging the dollar, and that's the red line there. Um, that's the share that's associated with the euro, plus an estimate, because uh, once again, for most of this period, we didn't know a lot of the holdings. They were unallocated, and so I'm making a guess that roughly a third are in euros. Um, what's of interest is if you look at the lines that start very much towards 2012, 2013, and then 2015, 16. Um, what are those? One is the sort of greenish, grayish line, and that's um, Australian, uh, Canada, and other currencies. And what you can see is actually that's, well, that's a rising component. Um, what's also rising is that red line, and those are holdings of the Chinese yuan, or the renminbi. The one thing I want to note is, yes, it's true that the yuan's holdings uh, have increased, but it's from a very, very, very low level. And if you were thinking that China would be able to uh, have its uh, currency be used as a primary uh, foreign exchange uh, currency, well, I think you'd, looking at this graph, you'd say they have a long ways to go. And in fact, when you see recent accounts and descriptions about who's gaining the most, it's really the other currencies like the Australian dollar, Canadian dollar, and so forth, uh, currencies of countries that are, well, I'll just note, um, usually thought of as allies of the United States, they're also currencies of, of countries that do what? In, in essence, are linked up with the global, uh, the Western financial system and don't have deep and extensive controls on financial flows, both within their countries and between, uh, across borders. Okay. So if I think about foreign exchange holdings, well, the dollar is still primary. If I think about financial transactions, uh, you probably heard a lot about um, how SWIFT is a messaging system which tells how, uh, banks how to conduct their uh, um, financial transactions. That is, if you're going to lend to somebody uh, before you make the actual execute the actual trade, what you're going to do is you're going to message it, and mostly these transactions are going through the SWIFT system, which is a system that's based in Brussels, uh, not in the United States. Um, well, here, even the U.S. dollar, uh, while it's roughly on par with, um, well, I shouldn't say it's on par, but it's, it's in, in general been above the euro in terms of number of transactions, what you can see is that it still remains, in some ways, dominant in terms of financial transactions. So if you're looking for a big movement there, I don't think you're, you're, you've seen it in the recent uh, past. If I look in borrowing, uh, so borrowing across borders, so I'm not including borrowing within the country, but if I'm looking at cross-border borrowing, here too you can see, well, yes, there's more borrowing in the euro, but the dollar has essentially been stable and increasing in terms of the amount of lending across borders. Okay. So here we have a whole bunch of uh, indicators which, which speak to how much is the dollar uh, dominating in terms of foreign exchange holdings, which are important sort of reserves, war chests, you might say, uh, for sort of uh, financial transactions that the state might under, uh, undertake, 
uh, in terms of financial transactions that private agents are undertaking, in terms of debt that's across borders, you can see that, yes, there's some slight erosion of the role of the dollar, the presence of the dollar, but it's, it's in many ways pretty resilient over time. And to the extent that um, the dollar is losing share, at least in foreign exchange holdings and in other dimensions, it's not primarily to, for instance, countries that you might think of as being quote unquote a competitor, it's uh, not to the renminbi, uh, it's to uh, currencies of other sort of Western nations that um, allow their currencies uh, to be freely traded in um, relatively open markets. Okay, so you know, if you're thinking about the dethroning of the dollar as the primary reserve currency, the primary international currency in the world, um, I'd say, you know, given the trends that we've seen, uh, it's much, much too premature. Now, this is not a statement about American triumphalism, uh, because, you know, there are both costs and benefits to having your currency being the currency that dominates in all financial or global financial transactions around the world. Um, you know, those costs include the, the constraints that might apply uh, to um, whatever you, monetary policy you can conduct. I mean, to a certain extent, you think about what monetary policies are going to be conducted in the United States, as Catherine mentioned, and as Adam noted, well, they're not just going to be, the effects will not be restricted just to the United States. They're going to be, in large part, dominating a lot of the impacts upon emerging market economies as well as the other advanced economies. So we carry the burden, rightly or wrongly, for the conduct of uh, world economic uh, macro behavior over the next few years, depending upon what we undertake. I mean, uh, other people point out to the extent that our currency is so um, uh, desired as uh, a foreign exchange uh, reserve holding, that means, for instance, our currency is probably stronger than it otherwise would be, making our, uh, our, our firms less competitive. It also enables us as a country to borrow, uh, both as a country and in terms of our treasury, borrow more easily from the rest of the world, which, uh, as Adam points out, then makes us in a situation where, well, we don't have to worry so much about how much debt we have. Uh, of course, that's a problem too. We don't have to worry so much about the debt we have. And so we might be spending more than we otherwise would be. Well, I should be careful. We are deficit spending more than we might otherwise uh, undertake. Okay, so um, let me just say, every 10 years, we have this concern about whether the dollar is going to be dethroned uh, from its role. Uh, I'll note, since uh, the end of World War II, there's never been a switch in what's the dominant currency. There's been a switch in the number two, and the switch in number two was uh, Britain and Germany, swapping the second and third roles. Um, now, uh, Barry Eichengreen uh, and uh, Jeff Frankel, uh, Jack Franklin and I on one side, we've been on separate sides of the debate. Where will this go eventually? Uh, we've discussed the possibility that uh, from Jeff Franklin and I, we, we argue that we're probably, given the inertia in the system, going to stay with a primarily a dollar-dominated uh, regime where maybe uh, um, you see other currencies rise up in importance. Whereas Barry Eichengreen is much more of the idea that you can support a, a multipolar uh, multi-currency world, uh, such as what was in the uh, interwar period. So time will tell, but I think the debate has uh, been brought in uh, sharper contrast by what? By the possibility of sanctions blowback. That's... Okay, so sanctions blowback. The conventional wisdom is sanctions were um, relatively ineffective, uh, except perhaps in the Iran case. Um, so I guess the, the, the question is, and I'm going to skip to the end, um, you know, only seven sanctioned banks were from SWIFT. They were um, banks that were sanctioned through the U.S. financial system. That is, you couldn't, you essentially prohibited um, uh, banks from uh, dealing with uh, Russian banks. Um, it wasn't through the SWIFT system. It was through the fact that we imposed sanctions which could apply to any institution that dealt with Russia. Um, what does that mean for um, the response, I think the idea would be that the Chinese, for instance, and that's the last point, um, the Russians tried to move away from holding on to dollars. The Chinese are probably thinking about that, but it's a balancing act. It's extremely costly 
to move away from using the dollar as a primary foreign exchange reserve holding. And in, in general transactions, you have to, you have to essentially get um, a new system set up for messaging, for instance. So uh, the choice is there. I don't think over the longer term they're going to stick with moving away from the dollar. Uh, and then the last thing is China has uh, clearly been thinking about this, and they've convened a high-level meeting uh, last, uh, I believe, two weeks ago, where they decided, you know, they didn't decide. They came to the roughly the conclusion, <coughs> not much we can do now. It's not feasible to move away from dollar, uh, big dollar holdings. So I just end here. There's lots of talk about the end of the dollar as the primary reserve currency, international currency, um, and then a reduction in American power as a consequence. I think those are overdone, although I've been wrong in the past, and so it could be, very much be the case that I'm wrong again. But I don't think whatever happens, you'll see the change really soon. So uh, right there, I'll end off. Thanks. Thanks, Menzi. Uh, we'll have comments from Mike. I know we're running a little over time, but we do have a little bit of wiggle room, so we will still have time for audience Q&A. But first, uh, Mike Netter. Thanks. Well, I'll be quick. Uh, Adam had it right. I'm a university ambassador now. Uh, I've graduated to that. And, uh, you know, I woke up at 4.30 this morning, and I made the mistake of looking at my phone. You know, you shouldn't do that. And I... I noticed that late last night, Menzi sent me his slides, and I thought, slides? I'm a university ambassador. I don't have any slides. We don't need those things. But I have a couple things to say. Um, but I really appreciate Adam and Catherine being here. Um, you know, for me, this is like being at Summerfest. Steve Miller, <laughs> Billie Eilish opened for us. And now you got the Holiday and Lounge Singer. But I want to amplify something that Adam talked about that I think is really important, and that is just the extent of labor market churn, um, you know, going back to Steve Davis and John Haltewanger probably did the most uh, foundational work on that subject uh, among the economics profession. And labor market churn is really underappreciated by most people, and I think, um, you know, all of that churn and, and the outcomes, the big things that have happened in the last 30 or 40 years that are probably creating a lot of stress for the U.S. economy are the growing sense of inequality and, and the reality of inequality um, might be exaggerated relative to consumption, uh, but certainly not relative to income or wealth. And also the shift in gender balance of household income uh, is another thing that I think is actually quite important to understanding politics today. But when you really try to unpack those sources of churn and inequality, you know, what people would point to in the last 40 years, globalization certainly played a role. Um, you know, I think the trade patterns that you're going to see when countries like China and India at their scale with a lot of relatively unskilled labor come into the global trading regime, you're going to see in a country like the United States with plentiful skilled labor, that, that's the scarce resource globally. So certainly a lot of the wage premium for college educated workers is driven in part by trade. Um, probably globalization helped income for owners of capital relative to labor. Uh, I think that has something to do with those trends. But I actually think globalization is the small player in this, and we've kind of blown out of proportion the responsibility for foreign actors in causing our problems. And maybe that's kept us from uh, having a revolution against ourselves. But I think the real driver of a lot of this churn is really the information technology revolution and its various incarnations. Uh, and now we're moving on to Web 3.0. But, you know, often we talk about this powerful dynamic force in America of creative destruction. And that is, in fact, what drives productivity growth uh, in the economy. But the information technology revolution was really different in that, you know, it had very concentrated ownership. These businesses are very scalable. So the, the you know, volume of revenue or earnings to employees is really different than for a manufacturing company. Uh, if you look at you know, the US economy today, I think 
seven or eight of the top 10 companies by market cap were founded after 1976. That doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. But that is a hallmark of our economy, and that, that causes a lot of the stress as well. It's not, in my opinion, mostly globalization. It's these other big sectoral changes. And it's probably a little bit culture, too. You know, um, we came up with different ways to compensate executives because finance professors realized uh, executives should be more aligned with owners of capital. And then people can mess around with that. But I, I remember, you know, at the excesses of the dot-com bubble, uh, I think Jack Welch kind of threatened his board that he was going to go to California and run a startup if they didn't pay him a lot more. Because after all, I'm running GE. Never mind I didn't build it, but I'm running GE. Surely I should make more than these punks out in the Bay Area that are making, you know, millions off their little startups. I don't think Jack Welch could have run a startup at that point, just to be clear, but I think, I think it was effective. And that did sort of ripple through the economy. And so um, I think all those things, culture and just creative destruction, are really the big drivers of these problems, but it's been easier to point at something else. And what's tragic about that is the biggest problems we face in the world today need to be solved through global engagement. I mean, do people really think if a few more universities divest from fossil fuels, but we have completely parted company with Russia and China, are we actually going to solve climate change and global warming and you know, fossil fuel consumption? I don't think so. Um, so that, that's problematic. So that's one thing I just want to emphasize. Uh, and I really appreciate the mission of the Peterson Institute uh, because of that. Secondly, uh, I thought I would say something about debt and deficits and quantitative easing. We haven't really talked about a couple minutes. Uh, so we haven't really talked much about that. And, and I'd say we're in a completely different world as it relates to fiscal policy and monetary policy than we've ever been. I'm relieved that Adam is, you know, comfortable with where we are, but I'll just give you a couple numbers that I find interesting. In 1989, Seymour Durst did something outlandish. You all know what that was. He's the gentleman who put up the debt clock in midtown Manhattan when the US federal debt was $2.7 trillion. He had a problem in 2008. It didn't have enough digits. We hit $10 trillion of debt. So he had to take the dollar sign off and replace it with a digit. Fast forward today, it's $30 trillion in counting. So we have grown our national debt a lot now. Just to get perspective, over that same period from 2008 to, 2000, to today, household net worth has gone from $60 trillion to $150 trillion at the end of 2021. It's probably down a little bit now. But you know, measured in that way, it doesn't look so alarming. Yet, I'd say between quantitative easing and loose fiscal policy, I'd say we don't really know exactly where we are. Uh, the history of fiat currencies is pretty brief in the broad sweep of history. And uh, I would say we're still learning about it. And, and I would be a little bit careful with, with how we're managing it today. Um, we certainly couldn't have done what we've done with fiscal and monetary policy unless everyone else was doing the same thing because what we've done is what would have been a case study for a currency crisis uh, in most countries. But I guess if we discovered if we all do this together, maybe it works, maybe it ushers in some unusual cryptocurrencies, we'll see what happens. But I'd be curious what uh, Adam thinks about that. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks to Mike and Minzy. Uh, we're gonna, we have a little bit of time for some question and answer. I think there's a couple mics that are gonna go around. So if you raise your hand and have a question, uh, if you can bre be brief with it and make sure that it's in the form of a question, that would be, uh, that would be great. Uh, I'm gonna throw out the first question for Adam, Adam and Catherine, which is, you know, all four of you on some level talked about, uh, but particularly Catherine and Adam, the importance of perceptions and narratives in shaping our economic policy debates. 
Uh, and so I'm interested in hearing both of you because you work in DC in capacities in the think tank world and in journalism of how do you see your role in helping to shape those narratives or you know, in, in some sense, as Adam was suggesting, that we need other narratives um, and sort of change the discussion of how we think about globalization and economic policy. So how do we do that? Which I know is a sort of very hard, difficult question. But. Uh, so sometimes I feel like I'm shouting into the wind. <laughs> But my job is to try to educate people, explain things about the economy, about the global economy and the domestic economy, so that these big, scary trends are more accessible and so that people are able to sort of truth squad the narratives that they hear from politicians, which are often convenient narratives, but not ones that are accurate. Um, I try to do this by you know, talking with a lot of experts like the people on this panel and figuring out how do I, um, sorry if this sounds like there's a little bit of feedback, but uh, how do I find ways to translate that into more uh, accessible, non-jargony English language. Um, but it's really challenging, particularly since n narratives can be very compelling, independent of facts. Whether you're talking about, like I mentioned, you know, there's this perception that we've had a huge increase in immigration. That's not true, as Adam talked about, as the data show. But there's that perception out there. Um, there's this perception that all of our ills are caused by China or by some other big, scary foreign enemy. Whether that, whether that foreign enemy is actually geographically somewhere else or, or in, you know, inside the United States being immigrants. Um, and, and I think that there's maybe some like primitive appeal to those kinds of narratives because it's easier to um, villainize, vilify some other party than to think about think through these complex questions of like, are wages changing because of automation? Are they changing because of you know technological, other kinds of technological developments? Um, but the 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 story, the the characters, you know that that politicians in particular like to use are, are much more seductive than looking at the actual numbers. And part of my job is to help people arm themselves so that they can be better judges of um, the, the rhetoric that they hear from politicians and of the policies that are being adopted by those politicians. But it's really challenging. Catherine. I think says it very well. Our, my job at a think tank is, is quite similar. We, we rely on relationships or at least fair consideration by influencers, to use the current term, like Catherine. Um, what I do is different from TikTok. I, I, I'm but. aware of that. <laughs> I, I, I do manage to distinguish, but yeah, OK. Um, but you know, and we've tried, and, and just as you've had the coal initiative here, the Peterson Foundation, which is separate from us um, but closely aligned, put a few million dollars to beef up at the Peterson Institute our graphics and our social media and our editorial team so that we can try to get out more stuff accessibly, honestly, but accessibly to people and they can pursue it at whatever level of depth they want. I, I'll just give a, a very current example. So. I didn't talk about this in my overly long remarks, but Catherine mentioned the idea that you know, one way you could possibly take some, in fact, would take some inflation away would be to reduce some tariffs. And um, colleagues of mine at Peterson, Gary Huffbauer, Yilin Wang, and Meg Hogan did a study recently um, in which they tried to actually, in a transparent way, figure out what the effect would be if you took away a reasonable amount of tariffs. And we did another study by um, Sherman Robinson and Karen Thierfelder, much more technically driven, but which ends up with basically the same answer. Both of them say, roughly, if you took away an amount of tariffs equivalent to what Trump put on, so you don't roll back the whole history of US trade protection, just take away roughly what Trump put on, you could take a point, 1.3% off inflation this year, probably. And when inflation is running 7% and every additional percent hurts more than the previous percent, that's meaningful. It's not going to take off inflation year after year after year, and we're very transparent about that. Anyway, this has been picked up, not accidentally, um, as part of an internal Biden administration debate, basically, over what tariff policy should be. 
and we've apparently gotten under USTR Ambassador Tai's skin with this, <laughs> and so she was asked about this publicly, our study and the issue, uh, at a conference last week, and she basically said we're a bunch of academic pinheads, and then, <laughs> no, I, I, that's not quite the quote, but it's pretty close, actually. And, and, and then it doesn't matter because the big picture, this isn't gonna work. And it's like, well, we're, we're trying to point out without being too obnoxious as academic pinheads that, you know, if you're busy saying tariffs are important to protect American steel workers, you're basically saying, as, as Catherine talked about and showed, you know, you're basically saying it, we have to drive a price wedge in there to make it so people choose to buy American stuff or can't buy foreign stuff, okay? So then you can't turn around and say it doesn't matter if we take away that price wedge. And so all you can try to do is, is, is make the case as honestly as you can, and that's why I'm here, frankly. So. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we do have time for a couple of questions, so if there is an audience question. Uh, and we have, over there. do we have someone with, with a mic? Thank you very much. Uh, this question's for the whole band. If you don't mind, all of you can speak. Um, one thing that you touched upon slightly is population in the United States. Of course, we have a worker shortage now, but in the long run, um, what do we do about the flat population growth? And does the economy have to align itself around that, or do we need to do something about our population? Can I, can I start on this? And I'm, I know everyone has something to say, but just um, Mark in his introduction uh, was kind enough to mention my work on Japan. And one of the things I was a big outside supporter of was what was called womenomics, which Prime, then Prime Minister Abe started in 2012. Basically, we know there's enormous sexism in Japan in the workplace all over. And, but yet, similar to U.S. and some other places, women go to college in equal or slightly higher numbers than men. And so there was all this talent being wasted. And Abenomics came out and made a bunch of tweaks and transparency things and a little bit of child care to try to increase women's labor force participation. And when it came out, um, the estimates were, oh, maybe this will raise labor force participation, participation by a couple hundred thousand. And the government was saying 500,000. And I came out publicly and said, no, I think it's going to be 800,000. I think it's going to be much more important than you think. Well, this many years later, female labor force participation in Japan is up by 3.5 million. Some of that's part time which is to be expected because women disproportionately take care of children and family and so on. And we know from experiences in Europe that enabling part-time work and providing childcare and things like that, a lot of stuff that was in Build Back Better that didn't get passed, um, can affect female labor force participation. So just to say, if even Japan, which in addition to whatever perceptions you have, really is a very sexist place, can make that much difference, we can do it too. And, and U.S., as a colleague of mine, Peterson has documented, Jacob Kierkegaard has documented, U.S. labor force participation is lousy compared to other countries. It always used to be higher. We have lower female labor force participation as a percentage of the comparable age people than Japan or Italy at this point. Not quite Italy, than Japan and most Western Europe. I mean, so there are things we can do. Um. So I would add to that, besides getting women's labor force participation up, immigration. <laughs> um, you know, as I showed in that chart, we have sort of this whole missing cohort of immigrants who right. never came here, legal immigrants, I, I always need to emphasize this, who never came here because of Trump policies, because of COVID, because Trump ratcheting up his policies, using COVID as an excuse. And then the, to the whole legal immigration system in the United States basically getting hollowed out in those years. And now that we have a new president in, in place, it's actually quite difficult to rebuild it. But if you want more 
working age population here, which is which I think is basically what you're asking about. You know, if we're talking about population growth, what that effectively means is also population aging. If if we're having a a stalling out of population growth, and and the census data from last year um, showed that I think we had the smallest population growth in decades. Um, and that's largely because, well, it's partly because of COVID, obviously, a lot of people passed away, um, but also birth rates were way down and um, net immigration was also um, a, a huge contributing factor that usually we have more people wanting to come here and contribute to the US economy and, and pay into the social security system, by the way, for our, that aging population. Um, so, you know, I think in the long run, what, what we want is that elusive uh, broader immigration reform, and there are a lot of things that are broken with our system that need to be fixed, um, some of which sh should have some bipartisan appeal, like DACA and whatever else, some of which are going to be much more controversial. Um, but ultimately, it comes down to if we're not going to, um, you know, get birth rates up here, uh, if, if we struggle to get more working age women in the labor force, um, there are plenty of people who want to come here and contribute to the U.S. economy, and historically have, but we've made it much harder. And I think our reputation has also suffered in the past few years. So even if we you know, get those consulates up and running again, um, you know, what's going to happen with uh, the foreign students who have historically seen the United States as a big draw, Australia and Canada are now uh, luring them away. So. That's a big part of the, the answer, and we've done a terrible job at dealing with it. Very well said. I'm, I'm pro-immigration, pro-women's labor force participation, but I would also say we can overdo it on growth in the labor force and growth in population. I care more about per capita living standards. Um, you know, As we get more elderly people and they live longer, maybe we do need to pay more attention to making sure that dependency ratio doesn't get too far out of whack. But, you know, even within the state, you know, when politicians talk about, you know, when I create 250,000 new jobs in my administration, I don't want those people on my lake, you know. I mean, at some point, you know, we don't necessarily benefit from that. And so I think we have to be more thoughtful about what the core objectives are. And to me, it isn't just GDP growth, it's really living standards and quality of life. And I think we learned something about that in the pandemic. I think people realized um, maybe there were things that we would do differently, but we'd gotten in bad habits. Well, um, I think a lot of the concerns and comments have been well laid out uh, by the other panelists. I, and so I'll just echo, we, we have lots of room for reform to bring uh, more people into the country um, in a thoughtful way, and I guess the concern is, you know, what's a thoughtful way? I'll just note, you know, low-hanging fruit, uh, a lot of evidence that allowing in more people under H-1B visas, that is, the, the special visas for um, scientific uh, specialties and so forth, um, people who have special talents, that can augment GDP measurably. Um, and so in that sense, per capita GDP, I think of as a thoughtful reform is important. But also the graph that Catherine put up about the shortfall in, in um, uh, foreign-born uh, labor force in the United States over the past few years indicates that there is some room for increasing the amount of people come in without a big negative impact upon uh, wages. Um, so, you know, to me, it seems to me that there's room for uh, improvement right there in terms of just both the economics but also uh, shoring up Social Security and, uh, and so forth in, in long term because we know on net immigrants are going to pay more into the Treasury and into the Social Security Trust Fund than they're going to be taking out at least for a good number of years given the fact that uh, on average they're younger. So I think there are lots of arguments for a thoughtful reform of the immigration system that would benefit the U.S. I uh, wish we could keep this great discussion going, but we are, we are over time. So please join me in uh, thanking Adam and Catherine and Menzi and Mike. Uh, it's, been, it's been a great discussion. Uh, Mike was joking that it was like Summerfest, which is actually true for academics. So um, to have, to have uh, Adam and Catherine here has been a real treat for me personally as well.